Welcome to iFormRx, where we explore the evidence that matters in ambulatory care pharmacy practice. Today, we'll be discussing the manuscript entitled Fish Oil Derived Fatty Acids in Pregnancy and Wheeze and Asthma in Offspring, which was published in December 2016 in the New England Journal of Medicine. Leading the discussion is Lauren Graycheck, PGY2 Ambulatory Care Pharmacy Practice Resident at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. Rates of asthma are on the rise. In 2001, 1 in 14 people in the United States were diagnosed with asthma. By 2009, that number had increased to 1 in 12. Among children, 1 in 10 or 10% had asthma in 2010. Why are rates of asthma increasing? While genetics is a factor, it is unlikely to be the primary reason for this increase. Some theories have posed that environmental exposure, such as smoking or pollution during pregnancy, have led to this increase in asthma prevalence. Additionally, it has been shown that each occurrence of urinary tract infection during pregnancy is associated with an increased risk of asthma in the offspring. This may be due to antibiotic use during pregnancy. However, the most powerful argument as to why asthma has become more prevalent relates to nutrient deficiency. Several observational studies have shown that offspring of women whose diet is deficient in N3 long-chain fatty acids have an increased risk of asthma. A longitudinal birth cohort examining maternal diets during pregnancy found that fish and apples had a potentially protective effect against the development of childhood asthma. Since most of the trials demonstrating the effectiveness of fish oil on reducing rates of asthma have been retrospective studies, a randomized controlled trial is needed to provide definitive proof. Since the publication of the fish oil-derived fatty acids in pregnancy and wheeze and asthma and offspring study in the New England Journal of Medicine in December 2016, the benefits of fish oil supplementation during pregnancy have been mentioned in articles from the Huffington Post, the New York Times, the Northwest Herald, and NPR. With many news sources talking about it, patients are likely to have heard about fish oil supplementation and may be asking for your opinion. What are you going to tell them? Today, we will help you with that answer. Based on the evidence that omega-3 fatty acids may protect against many chronic inflammatory diseases, it has been hypothesized that they might also decrease the inflammatory processes that occur in the lungs, which in turn could decrease the occurrence of asthma and wheezing. Due to changes in dietary habits, many women today consume less N3 polyunsaturated fatty acids than in the past. The N3 polyunsaturated fatty acids include icosapentaenoic acid, also referred to as EPA, and docosahexaenoic acid, also known as DHA. The fish oil-derived fatty acids in pregnancy and wheeze and asthma and offspring study was conducted in Denmark and was part of the Copenhagen Prospective Studies on Asthma and Childhood 2010 Pregnancy Cohort. The investigators hypothesized that maternal diet during pregnancy influences maturation and regulation of neonatal immune response. Therefore, supplementation with N3 long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids during pregnancy could potentially modulate the development of asthma and other immunologically-based childhood diseases. Women were identified for recruitment by reviewing the claims data for mandatory pregnancy visits to general practitioners. Eligible women received an invitation in the mail to participate, and recruitment occurred from 2008 through 2010. The last child included in the study was born in April 2011. Once born, children became part of the birth cohort and were followed until at least five years of age. This study was a single-center, double-blind, placebo-controlled parallel group trial. A total of 736 pregnant women were enrolled and 695 children were included in the report. Women between 22 to 26 weeks gestation were eligible to participate but could not be taking more than 600 international units of vitamin D per day because there was another study examining the effects of vitamin D in the Copenhagen Prospective Studies Program. Furthermore, women with any endocrine, heart, or kidney disorders were also excluded. At 24 weeks gestation, women were randomly assigned in a 1 to 1 ratio to receive either 2,400 mg per day of N3 long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids or placebo. The N3 fatty acid product contained roughly 1,320 mg per day of EPA and about 880 mg per day of DHA. This supplement represented an estimated tenfold increase over the normal daily intake of N3 long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids. The placebo was composed of olive oil, which was chosen because the amount of N9 and N6 fatty acid in this formulation represents about only 3% of normal daily intake of polyunsaturated fatty acids. 
Supplementation continued until one week after delivery. Both groups were instructed to take four capsules per day, and women self-administered the capsules at home with adherence measured by capsule count. The study remained blinded until the youngest child in the trial reached three years of age. The primary endpoint of the trial was persistent wheeze or asthma, described as the age at onset of persistent wheeze, diagnosed according to a predefined algorithm. The child was classified as having persistent wheeze up to age 3, after which time the diagnosis of asthma was given. Secondary endpoints included the age of onset of severe asthma exacerbations, the age of onset of eczema diagnosis, allergic sensitization at 6 and or 18 months of age, and the number of lower respiratory tract infections. Follow-up data was obtained one week after birth, as well as at 1, 3, 6, 12, 18, 24, 30, and 36 months after birth and yearly thereafter. Wheezing and asthma are closely related but are different phenomena. Wheezing is a high-pitched whistling sound heard during breathing. Vibrations and oscillations produce the sound when air is passing through at a high velocity through nearly closed airway walls. Wheezing is common in the first few years of life and has numerous causes. By the age of three, one in three children will have had at least one wheezing episode and upwards of 50% of children will have had a wheezing episode by the age of six. Wheezing is more common in children compared to adults due to physical differences in the size of the airways. Despite the high prevalence of wheezing in children, most children will be symptom-free by the age of six as their airways develop. However, wheezing persists in some children. The diagnosis of asthma should be considered when wheezing worsens in an episodic pattern in response to bronchodilators. In this study, both groups were relatively well matched for key characteristics and no statistically significant differences were present. Male sex is important as males are more likely to have wheezing in early childhood, however males are more likely to remit wheezing by early adult life compared to females. Smoking, animals in the home, antibiotic use, and preterm birth have all been linked to chronic inflammatory diseases such as wheezing and asthma. Of note, this study only included data about smoking and dog and cat ownership at the time of pregnancy. Information about smoking or pet ownership once the child was born was not reported. This is particularly important as some women may stop smoking during pregnancy but may restart smoking after the birth of the child. Similarly, some families may have introduced a pet into their home after the child was born, therefore these are both confounding factors that were not accounted for in the manuscript or supplemental materials. The age of the mother at the time of birth is relevant because with increasing age, the risk of asthma in the offspring reduces, and most of the women in this study were in their early 30s. Lastly, there was a relatively low percent of mothers or fathers in the study population who had a history of asthma. During the pre-specified double-blind follow-up period, 136 of the 695 children ages 3 through 5 received a diagnosis of persistent wheeze or asthma. Risk of persistent wheeze or asthma was 16.9% in the fish oil group and 23.7% in the control group. This difference was statistically significant. Treatment with N3 long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids reduced the risk of persistent wheezing or asthma by slightly more than 30%. However, the most striking finding was that the effect of supplementation was largely driven by women who had low EPA and DHA blood levels at randomization. In this subgroup, 17.5% of the intervention group developed persistent wheeze or asthma compared to 34.1% of the control group, representing a relative risk reduction of more than 50% with fish oil supplementation. After continued follow-up to five years of age, there was a statistically significant reduced risk of persistent wheeze or asthma among children in the treatment group as compared with the control group. Again, the offspring of women with the lowest baseline blood concentrations of EPA and DHA at the time of randomization appeared to derive the greatest benefit from supplementation. It should be noted that the difference between the supplementation and placebo groups did not become fully apparent until the children were about three years of age. This difference was maintained thereafter. In a post hoc analysis, the benefit from supplementation was strongest in offspring of women who had the lowest dietary intake of EPA and DHA, defined as less than 321 mg per day before the intervention took place. Additionally, an analysis of the FADS gene was conducted. The FADS gene encodes fatty acid desaturase. This gene is responsible for catalyzing the final step in the formation of EPA and arachidonic acid. Therefore, women with variants in this gene may have particularly low EPA and DHA blood concentrations. Previous studies have found that children with minor alleles, such as the G allele, 
had lower activity of the FADS gene, thus resulting in reduced amounts of arachidonic acid and increased amounts of unmetabolized precursors. The study found that the offspring of mothers who carried this FADS gene variant had the greatest benefit from fish oil supplementation. Approximately 15% of children in the intervention group developed persistent wheeze or asthma compared to nearly 38% in the control group. This represents a relative risk reduction of 63% in children of women with the FADS GG genotype who were given omega-3 fatty acids. Therefore, FADS genotyping could be used as a test to identify women who would most benefit from this intervention. Based on the study findings, it appears that fish oil used in a dose that is 10 times the normal dietary intake during the third trimester of pregnancy may prevent asthma. However, in those children who developed asthma, it had no impact on the frequency of asthma exacerbations. Another interesting finding was that fish oil supplementation during pregnancy may prevent lower respiratory infections in offspring with a relative risk reduction of 25%. This could help reduce other complications in sick days related to asthma. Fish oil supplementation unfortunately had no impact on the development of other immune-mediated diseases such as eczema. The prevalence of persistent Weezer asthma was lower among children of mothers who received supplementation, but supplementation was only effective in children of women who had a low EPA DHA plasma concentration at baseline. So is it worth screening women to determine if they have a low EPA DHA concentration? The test would cost from $30 to $100, and the FADS genotype testing is even more costly. Alternatively, we can target supplementation towards women who do not consume very much fish oil in their diet. In North America, the average woman consumes approximately 120 milligrams of EPA and DHA per day. Should we assume that in the United States, most women would benefit because they likely consume far less N3 fatty acids in their diet compared to women in Denmark? Another question for you to consider, how long should we treat women with fish oil? In this study, women took supplementation until one week after birth of their child, but EPA and DHA concentrations in breast milk at one month were not correlated with the development of persistent wheeze or asthma. Based on this finding, can we assume that fish oil supplementation is only beneficial when provided during pregnancy and it is unnecessary to take it after birth? And lastly, the Copenhagen Prospective Studies on Asthma Group conducted a simultaneous study in women who were randomized to receive high-dose vitamin D. Exploratory analysis stratified according to randomization to receive high-dose vitamin D found the strongest effect of N3 long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acid supplementation occurred in children of mothers who did not receive high-dose vitamin D supplementation. The author suggests that this finding may be due to a possible interaction between vitamin D and N3 fatty acids and that they may be targeting the same pathways. To help us answer some of the clinical questions that arose from the study and to help us determine how this information should be used in practice, I would like to introduce our expert panel for a roundtable discussion. Joining me are Dr. Dennis Williams and Dr. Sarah Westberg. Dr. Williams is currently the Vice Chair for Professional Education and Practice and an Associate Professor at the University of North Carolina School of Pharmacy. He practices in pulmonary medicine at UNC Hospitals. Dr. Westberg is the Co-Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs and an Associate Professor at the University of Minnesota College of Pharmacy. She practices in the Women's Health Center at the University of Minnesota Medical Center. For our first question today, was the study surprising to you in any way? One thing I really liked about the study, I felt that this uh, cohort design was really a remarkable thing. And the fact that they conducted these randomized controlled trials within the cohorts, um, I thought was a really unique design. One thing I discovered is that there's COPSIC 2010 cohort website, which really gives a lot of information about these different randomized trials that, that they were conducting simultaneously. What surprised me a little bit is that we've seen a lot of studies published with various supplements in pregnancy, and oftentimes the studies have a lot of limitations, um, especially small sample sizes that limit the interpretation of those studies. So I was really impressed with the robustness of the trial and believe it provided meaningful positive data that we can apply in clinical practice. What do you feel were the major strengths of the study? 
um, a major strength is that it was randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled. The assignment remained blinded until the subjects were the age of three, and then remained blinded to the investigators until age five. So just that long duration to follow children, not just to the time of birth, but until the age of five is a is an unusual thing to see in pregnancy studies sometimes. So that was a really strong positive. It was also positive that there was no corporate sponsorship and uh, the treatments were funded by the, by the study group. They weren't donated by the pharmaceutical manufacturers. They also assessed for a lot of multiple variables, including genetic risk factors, which I think really adds to the richness of the data. I found the study design to be really strong. The statistical analysis was, was very complete. They had really great participation and retention of the subjects. And, I, and I, I was really pleased that they had an adherence measure in this study as well. And they reported the fact that, that the majority of the patients were very adherent with the therapy. And I also thought that the information about the baseline levels of EPA and DHA were helpful in interpreting the results. Because of all of those things, I thought the internal validity was uh, really strong in that investigators did a really good job in addressing uh, some of the uh, confounders. Are there any significant weaknesses that challenge this study's internal or external validity? So I have a few things to mention, uh, as obviously we typically find in some of the studies. And of course, the fact that uh, it was a single site is something that we should note. And I, I feel that that's particularly relevant because it's a study that's looking at the risk of developing a disease. And there's a lot of dietary things and environmental things that could impact that. And obviously, those things might vary in different uh, populations. The other thing I noted, dose of the fish oil supplement that they used would be 20 times what it would be uh, in a in a U.S. diet as part of normal uh, intake. And so I think that would be something we'd have to look into a little bit more. And then there were a couple of areas. When I first read this paper, I uh, started thinking about some other variables. I went into the supplementary uh, index and found a, a few things that were kind of interesting, some of which they addressed and some of which they didn't. And first was smoking. So in this cohort of patients, uh, about 7.8% of the women uh, smoke. And when you look at the assignment to either treatment or control, uh, the treatment group smoking uh, prevalence was 6.1% versus 9.5% in the control group. They didn't really talk about it beyond reporting that uh, in the uh, supplementary index. And then at the same time, one thing that I noted was that they didn't gather any information on secondhand smoke exposure. And so when we think about the risk of asthma and other atopic diseases, certainly those are things that we uh, think about. I would agree with your summary, Dennis. Those are some of the same things I had picked out as well, was those differences between the treatment and control groups. Another potential weakness that was raised in a letter to the editor of the New England Journal was a concern that potentially olive oil, which was in the placebo treatment, may have some benefit. There is some previous literature that has also shown that olive oil during pregnancy might be associated with reduced wheezing during the first year of life. Now, the researchers in this, art, in this particular study argued that the olive oil doses were low enough that there probably was not a therapeutic effect. But again, even with that weakness, that would underestimate the effect of the treatment group. Um, so the results are still uh, quite applicable and valid. You all brought up some great points. Uh, the smoking thing was definitely something I looked at because they looked at smoking before birth. But what about the secondhand smoke of the smoking once the child was born? And what about if they got a dog when the child turned two? So I think some of those things were pretty interesting to consider for your environmental factors. One of the arguments against this study is that it is not applicable to all nations. How do you see this information applying to our population in the United States? Do you find the results compelling enough to take action in your own practice? And if so, what would you recommend your patients use? I think one of the strengths of this research trial, as Dennis already talked about, is that they actually assessed baseline intake of 
omega threes as well as blood levels in the in the cohort, so that we can sort of account for some of those cultural dietary differences as we look to apply it outside of the Copenhagen group. I think the applicability for me is. I guess I would phrase it as uh, stay tuned. I think it was very good uh, information. It certainly adds to the body of knowledge that we have. I think there are a number of considerations that I would make before coming up with specific recommendations. First of all, of course, we have to mention the fact that talking about a dietary supplement and in the United States, we worry somewhat about uh, the regulation of dietary supplements and we, we worry a little bit about content validity. And so I think they did a good job in this paper in terms of talking about how the assessment that they went through. But when we're looking at products to pick in the United States, it would be one of the considerations that I would definitely think think about. I agree with Dennis that we have to be cautious in how we apply this widely and we have to be cautious with the types of dietary supplements available and ensuring an adequate high quality product. But I, I do think there is compelling information here that a lot of women would like to know, particularly women who consume low amounts of omega-3s within their diet. There's this potential for a, a positive impact on reducing wheeze and asthma in the offspring. And I think a lot of women would like to know that and understand that. And omega-3s are often recommended in pregnancy anyway due to past somewhat mixed but data available on impact of brain development. So in my clinical practice, simple dose of omega-3s is frequently recommended. And I think one of the questions that still remains after the study is, is do you need this high of a dose of omega-3s or is a lower dose also going to provide a benefit? One thing we haven't talked about yet is that there was some concern raised by one of the letters to the New England Journal after this paper was published about the concern potentially of bleeding risk in infants born preterm who were exposed to high levels of fish oil during pregnancy, um, that potentially there could be a hemorrhage risk there that would not have been found in this study just due to the rarity of that event. Sarah, I think that was a great point. The other thing that, that I kind of saw missing there was a little bit about how well this therapy was tolerated. Again, thinking about a female in the third trimester and are there any less serious side effects that people might experience when using these therapies? That's a very good point. Lots of heartburn in the third trimester of pregnancy and that fish oil may not sit well with every woman, that's for sure. Thank you again to Dr. Williams and Dr. Westberg for their insights and commentary regarding the fish oil-derived fatty acids in pregnancy and wheeze and asthma and offspring trial. In summary, this study suggests that for mothers with low levels of EPA and DHA, providing high levels of EPA and DHA supplementation through fish oil during the third trimester of pregnancy will decrease the risk of persistent wheeze and asthma and offspring, as well as reduce the risk of lower respiratory infections. However, several questions are remaining. How do we properly test women for this deficiency? Do we need to test women for the deficiency? And if so, who do we target for testing? And then furthermore, how much EPA and DHA is needed for us to see our desired effect? What are your thoughts about this trial? How should the evidence be applied to patient care? What changes are you going to make to your practice? We would love to hear your thoughts and welcome your comments. Thank you for listening to this CaptaCast by iPharmRx, where we explore the evidence that matters to ambulatory care pharmacy practice.